Dr. Adam Ghazali is founder of the Neuroscience Imaging Center at the University of California, San Francisco, and he happens to be an expert in the science of distraction. When you make a decision to focus on something, what we now understand is that the front part of your brain, the prefrontal cortex, has projections to the visual part or the auditory part of its sound that allows you to increase the processing of that information more if it's relevant to you, if it's your focus, and less if it's irrelevant to you, if you're trying to ignore it. This process called top-down modulation is what allows us to read a book on a noisy subway or study for a test in a busy dorm room. We found that there are connections between the front part of your brain and the visual part of the brain and another part of your brain known as the hippocampus that becomes essentially disconnected when you are looking at, at distracting information. But could the effects of these digital distractions have an impact on how we respond to the world around us and more important, each other? Face-to-face -face social communication is what our brains are evolved for. We are evolved to be able to interact in incredibly complex social networks, to solve incredibly difficult symbolic problems together. Professor Mary Helen Imardino Yang is an assistant professor of the University of Southern California's Brain and Creativity Institute. In a recently published paper, Professor Imardino Yang and colleagues presented astounding findings related to two interdependent networks functioning inside our brains. The looking out network responds to the physical world around us. When we see someone twist their ankle stepping off the sidewalk and we go, ah, that looks like it hurt. How do you know that hurt? You know it hurt because you see their ankle do something and you imagine that on your own ankle to a degree and then you feel back what that would be and you share with them empathically something of their own pain. Our brain also has a system that looks in. This network is focused not on external activity, but instead on internal thoughts. That network is, it appears to be um, disrupted when you're interrupted from the, the outside world around you, when you need to attend to things around you. So you can be daydreaming and kind of chewing over, you know, some social situation and what it means to you or some memory as you're driving your car, but it's, you know, through just regular traffic and you're just kind of thinking about other stuff. As soon as an accident starts to happen or something starts to um, demand your attention, you immediately stop that daydreaming, you pay attention into the world and it disrupts your ability to reflect on the meaning of things. So what happens when our devices make this kind of deep reflection almost impossible? Kids who are, are overusing social technology to communicate things that are about emotion, that are about relationships, that are about meaning, that are about the future, uh, and not about right here and now, um, not buy milk now, but should we have children in 10 years? You know, these kinds of long-term questions that don't lend themselves well to these kinds of technological exchanges, if they sort of um, migrate themselves into these technological exchanges, they could very well um, be undermined for their emotional quality and turn into sort of action-oriented items as compared with meaning-oriented moral items. And um, that's an open question, uh, but uh, neurobiologically it seems very plausible that that's happening. <laughs>